Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Planning Commission. Uh, I would like to first uh, call on Mr. Turner to provide information about how the public can communicate in on tonight's call. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Dorn. Uh, regarding the procedures for communicating tonight, the commissioners will have their webcams on for the duration of the meeting. For those presenting on an item on tonight's agenda, uh, we ask that you also turn on your microphone and webcam during the presentation of your item. A member of staff will assign you keyboard and mouse controls if, you're, if you are um, displaying a presentation. We then kindly ask that you turn off your webcam and microphone when done with the presentation portion of your item, unless called upon by the chair. During the public comment period, members of the public will have an opportunity to share their comments or questions by clicking on the hand icon on your screen, uh, upon which staff will introduce you and activate your microphone. Uh, if you are calling in to tonight's meeting, um, please click star nine on your keypad um, and that will notify staff uh, that you have a comment. If multiple people are speaking from the same account, please let us know at the beginning of your time and we will make sure that each person gets a chance to speak. And with that, I will hand it back to you. Thank you very much. So I will call the roll, make sure we're here. Uh, Commissioner Barnes. Not present. Commissioner DeCarty. Here, good evening. Commissioner Harris. Here. Commissioner Kennedy. Here. Commissioner Riggs. I am here. Commissioner Tate. Present. And myself, Chair Doran. So we have uh, six members with uh, Commissioner Barnes absent for the moment. We do have a quorum. We'll, we're going to proceed. Uh, first item on the agenda is reports and announcements. Ms. Sandmeyer, do you have anything to impart? Good evening, Chair Dorn and Commissioners. I don't have any updates, but I'm happy to answer questions. Do you have any questions for Ms. Sandmeyer? Seeing none, uh, I'm going to move to public comment. Under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject not listed on the agenda and items listed under consent calendar. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda and therefore the commission cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. I'd like to remind members of the public, we will have public comment uh, later for each item that is on the agenda. This is for items not on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Turner, do we have any hands raised? I don't see any hands raised at the moment. Um, just as a reminder, if you do have, uh, if you do wish to give public comment, click the raise hand button at the bottom of uh, your Zoom window or if you're calling in star nine, let us know you have a comment. Still no hands raised. Uh, we have a hand raised from the commission, Commissioner Tate. Oh yes, I just happened to notice that um, Commissioner Barnes is stuck in the attendees uh, area. So I think he needs to get promoted. He probably had trouble with uh, his Zoom update like the rest of us. <laughs> I certainly sympathize with that. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, I'm gonna leave public comment open for a minute while staff tries to get Commissioner Barnes onto the panel. Um, there he is. It's a, it's a lot like getting noticed in the VIP line. You're like you're like one of the people and someone, the bouncer picks you out of the crowd and says, you, you're in. <laughs> Thank well, you for that, Michelle. I, I would like to note for the record, Commissioner Barnes, you are a VIP. <laughs> so the rope is open for you. <laughs> the velvet, thank you. I, I apologize. I did have a little bit of trouble. My, my yes, we, we all had a little trouble tonight. Um, okay, so all commissioners are present. Um, Mr. Turner, do we have any hands raised for public comment? Um, no hands raised at this time. Okay, I'm going to close public comment and move to the next item on the agenda, the consent calendar. 
The only item on the consent calendar tonight is the approval of minutes from the January 10th, 2022 Planning Commission meeting. This was continued from February 28th, 2022 uh, for a correction. Do we have anyone that would like to remove the minutes from the consent calendar? Commissioner Ricks. I'd like to move approval of the consent item. Do we have a second? Commissioner Kennedy. Okay, I'll call the roll. Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Ducardi. Yes. Harris. Yes. Kennedy. Yes. Riggs. Yes. Date. Abstain. And I will vote in favor. So the consent calendar is approved on a vote of six in favor with one abstention. Now I'll open the public hearing portion of tonight's meeting. Uh, the only item under public hearing is F1, a use permit and variance by Scott Landry at 628 Cambridge Avenue. This is a request for a use permit to remodel and construct first floor additions to an existing non-conforming one-story residence on a substandard lot with regard to minimum lot width and area in the R2 low density apartment zoning district. The proposed work would exceed 50% of the existing replacement value in a 12 month period and requires use permit approval. Additionally, the proposal includes a request for a variance to construct additions within the required right side setback. Uh, we do have a staff report on this. Um, and the staff report is by um, Ms. Uh, Khan. Uh, do we have Ms. Khan here? Do you have any additions uh, or corrections to the staff report? Uh, good evening, commissioners and members of the public. I do not have any update to the staff report. However, I would like to note that the uh, neighbor correspondence or support letter was shared uh, earlier this uh, earlier today, which was shared with the commission. Uh, this happened after the publication of the staff report, which is why it's not included as part of the staff report. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions, any clarifying questions for Ms. Khan at this time? Don't see any. Um, do we have a representative from the applicant to make a res presentation tonight? Yes, we do have um, Aaron Worth uh, from the architects team, and we also have the property owner, Andy Russell, and his Russell. wife joining us today. So I'll hand it over to Aaron for a quick uh, presentation, or um, you know, talk about the project a little bit. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Worth I'm with Studio 101 Designs. We're the uh, designers on the project here over at 628 Cambridge. This is our second project with the Russell Cook family. So uh, good to see you guys over there. Um, as you had mentioned, we're, it's, uh, it's kind of a twofold thing here. We have a uh, use permit on kind of two grounds there. The first one being it's a substandard lot, which kicks us over to you guys regardless. And then we are uh, uh, affecting more than, I believe, 50% of the structure. So that is another use permit uh, item there. And then uh, there's a variance um, in regards to the north side of the structure. We're proposing an addition for a bedroom. Um, and the existing house is built up against a driveway that they share with the neighbors at 626. Um, and then the actual like building setback exists somewhere kind of in their living room. So we would be looking for a 50% reduction in that in order to build an addition on the back to provide another bedroom for their kids, which is the uh, kind of the impetus for this whole thing. They have uh, two children that are uh, approaching their teenage years and I believe it was the daughter said she was requesting her own bedroom or she was going to run away. So, um, what we're proposing is two, two bedrooms out of a single one and reworking in a, like an interior bathroom. And then uh, as part of that, adding on a little work from home space onto the side of the master bedroom. So the, uh, the first edition, the one that would require the uh, variance is going to be enveloped within the gable form of the like existing structure. Uh, it would require a re-roof through that entire area. And then the, uh, the work from home space would be a more modern 
uh, box shape, which would uh, relate to a, an old, um, uh, or our previous design, which was for a, uh, the garage in the back, which was a kind of a modern shape, a modern square. Um, yeah, let's, uh, and then all of our, all of our um, what is it, materials uh, are previously used on the site. It's a, it's lap siding or cedar, which the cedar exists in the eaves and on the, uh, the garage structure. And then the rest of it is uh, just uh, comp shingle to match what is already there. And I think that's about it. Andy and Aaron, if you guys want to take over it, but that'd be it for me. Thank you, Aaron, for, for the synopsis, and thank you all for considering. Uh, we're really excited to, to be here and uh, hopefully working with you on this project. Thanks. Yep, thank we you. don't want our daughter to run away. <laughs> 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 it's a tiny house, and we're just trying to make the most of it. We love Menlo Park, and we love Allied Arts, and so just want to add 100 square feet, please. Thank you. Well, I'm sure we don't want to be responsible for making your daughter run away either. <laughs> Um, do we have any clarifying questions for the applicants or their architect? Okay, I'd like to open it up to public comment before we bring it back to the commission. Uh, Mr. Turner, do we have any hands raised for public comment at this time? At the moment, I don't see any hands raised. Um, just as a reminder, if you do wish to give public comment, click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen or if you are calling in, um, press star nine. Yeah, let's give them a few minutes, a few moments anyway. Um, still no hands raised. Okay. I will close public comment and bring it back to the commission. Um, I think I'll lead off with the comment that, you know, the, the variances are sort of a high standard to meet. Uh, but I feel that this is a fairly unique case and that it's a, it's a R2 zone lot with a single family on it and a family trying to make it work in an unusual lot in a fairly high density neighborhood. A lot of the neighborhood is zoned for R3 and above. Um, so I really hope that uh, you know, we can find a way to uh, approve this and hopefully not take a, a lot of time on it. That, that's my view. Uh, Commissioner Kennedy. Uh, yeah, I echo what uh, Chair Doran just shared because um, you know one of the great things about this house, I do know the Russells, um, one of the great things about this house is that it is one of two bungalows that are that at one point were identical, and the creativity with which they um, invested in a previous remodel is incredible. What they have created out of that very small, what I used to call before it, they purchased it, I was like, oh, look at those cute shotgun shacks at the corner, um, and it's really remarkable. And in this neighborhood where there is so little of its original character remaining, um, those houses are really unique and they speak to a very particular time. It also speaks to the desire for folks to live in a modest amount of space that fits their family's needs. And that is this. And if, if there was ever an opportunity to work with you know, a variance, this is that time. Um, so I would hope that we could get to a decision of approving this project really rapidly, um, because I think this is a good one. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Harris. Yes, uh, I echo Chair Doran's remarks. I just had a quick question, if I may, um, for staff through the chair. <clears throat> um, so on this one, more than 50% of the value. Um, therefore, they've got to come to us, even though they probably they would have had to anyway because of the substandard lot. Um, I noticed then that the value is based on 200 
dollars per square foot. And I, my question to staff is how is this amount determined and how often is it reviewed? Because it seems that it would affect um, which property owners might have to come to us um, and, and how often that might be changed or reviewed. Um, yes. Uh Good evening, Commissioner uh, Harris. So this is a valuation that has been provided to us by the building division. And uh, this is the valuation that we used for all properties that are non-conforming here in the city. Um, I am not aware of the last update that was done, but I could get back to you on that answer. Um, I could defer to um, acting principal planner, Karina, uh, to add if she has any additional um, information on this. I think um, that's a good question. Um, I don't believe it's been updated in a while, um, but one thing to consider is the the value for the new work hasn't been updated either. So as construction um, costs go up, it doesn't necessarily, mm -hmm. I don't think it, it would mean more use permits because we haven't updated it. If that's that's kind of the question. So, so you're saying it affects the numerator and the denominator of that 50%? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So since both haven't been updated, um, maybe that helps a little bit. OK. Um, thank you for that. And if if somebody could get back to me, that'd be great. Or if you could tell me who I might talk to, that'd be great. Thank you. And I, I'd like to request staff and the building division, if they have a list of contractors in Menlo Park that can add space for $200 a square foot, I'd like to get that list because I'm going to do a lot of building in my lot. <clears throat> uh, do we have any other commissioners that would like to speak on this application? Commissioner DeCarty. Uh, I was going to make a motion, so I'll defer to Commissioner Riggs. Yeah, that was the fastest finger competition there. Commissioner Riggs. You're on mute. You're still on mute, Commissioner Riggs. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, I'd like to move to approve the project and make the findings for the variance. Thank you. Um, do we have a second? Second. Okay, I'm not sure who was first on that, but Commissioner Kennedy's in the upper left, so I'll say Commissioner Kennedy seconded the motion, and I'll call the roll. Commissioner Barnes. Commissioner Barnes, we're voting yes. on Thank you. Commissioner DeCarty. Yeah, I agree with the sentiments of my fellow commissioners, yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Commissioner Kennedy? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? Yes. Commissioner Tate? Yes. All vote in favor. So the application as submitted uh, with the findings as submitted is approved with a vote of seven to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your support. Thank you. So with that, I will close the public hearing portion of tonight's meeting. Uh, we do have a presentation item on the agenda, item G1. This is to receive a presentation from planning staff on recently approved and currently proposed Bayfront projects. Uh, and I believe that is uh, in care of Ms. Sandmeyer, is that correct? No, Mr. Prada. Uh, good evening, it's me. Um, but hang on, my lighting's a little dark in here. I'm gonna turn on some more lights. I'll, right, I'll be right back and we'll, we'll, we'll get started. Okay. Well, that's a little better, but either way, we'll, we'll get the presentation started. So good evening, uh, Chair Doran and members of the commission. So what we have here tonight is a brief presentation to give the commission an update overview of the projects that we have in the Bayfront area 
um, either currently un, under review on file or recently approved or under construction. So to give a, a quick update uh, to the commission. So hang on one second, let me get this started. Okay. All right, so like, like I said, this is a <clears throat> presentation. It's an opportunity for the commission to learn more about uh, the projects we currently are reviewing and ask questions. It is a presentation item, so uh, discussion should be limited. Certainly, if there are follow-ups that the commission is interested, we can, we can schedule those at another meeting as, as a, a meeting agenda availability allows. Uh, but tonight, it's, it's more of a, a presentation from staff, uh, an opportunity for questions, uh, clarifying questions. So by, by way of update here, just wanted to uh, give a overview of the Bayfront area zoning map. So, so the, the uh, Connect Menlo general plan update uh, was adopted in the end of 2016. It created uh, the new zoning districts of the O office, RMU residential mixed use, and uh, the life sciences or LS zoning district. And so you'll, you'll see those on the map here in blue, uh, uh, orange and then a light light blue for life science over in the kind of right side of the screen. Uh, for the for the purpose of the presentation, we'll consider Willow Road running in a north south orientation. So when we go through the projects, we'll talk about projects west of Willow Road and then east of Willow Road. Uh, so this map also identifies the locations of the Paseos, which are the blue dash lines, and so those will show up throughout uh, the projects at the. Uh, commission reviews over the has been reviewing and will continue to review as the projects that we're reviewing in, as staff uh, come forward to the planning commission for review and either action or recommendation to the council. And so uh, just a high level overview of the projects, the, the, uh, this is a map of the Bayfront area. It, it's showing the projects we have on file or have recently um, finished reviewing. Uh, the residential kind of in a brown with mixed use in orange, uh, oh, um, blue for office, and then there's a hotel project uh, is labeled as non-residential here in the top left corner at Haven uh, where it bends, uh, and we'll go through all these in detail, and then the life science is in the purple. So projects west of Willow Road. So just a, a more detailed overview map, uh, what we'll focus on to start is 111 Independence Drive project, Menlo Portal, and 123 Independence. Those are residential or residential mixed use, um, uh, mainly Menlo Portal that has an office component. And then there's a proposed hotel uh, along Haven Avenue. And I, I should mention that all of the projects that the city is currently reviewing in the Bayfront area are at the bonus level. So what that means is that they are uh, proposed at a higher level of density or intensity and or height in exchange for community amenities. We won't go into that in detail uh, for all the projects today, but everyone is at the bonus level with the exception of the hotel. The hotel is at a base level project. So that's Hotel Moxie shown on the screen here in the, in the left side of the screen. Okay, so 111 Independence Drive. So this project was actually approved by the Planning Commission in April of 2021. Uh, the, the image here is the rendering of, of the project. And this project is 105 dwelling units, uh, a mix of studios, one bedroom, the two bedroom units. It does include 14 below market rate housing units uh, at varying levels of affordability. So it's a mix of incomes. Uh, the community amenities that were approved by the planning commission uh, as part of the proposed project include four additional below market rate units above the 15% minimum requirement and the ground floor cafe. And as I mentioned, it was approved in April of 2021. So right next to the 111 Independence Drive project is the Menlo Portal project. Uh, this project is a mixed use project. You're looking here from uh, the Northeast at the office building at the corner and then the uh, apartment residential building uh, behind it. And then around the bend is the 111 Independence Drive, which is kind of shown in a, in a grayed out um, a rendering there. So this project is uh, 335 dwelling units, about 34,500 square feet of office and an additional 1600 square foot commercial space. The residential component includes 48 
uh, below market rate units, but once again, at a mix of affordability levels. Uh, this project was approved by the commission uh, in the summer of last year, and it was the appeal to the council and that appeal was up or was denied and the, up, uh, the council upheld the uh, commission's approval of the, of the project. Uh, that project included a community amenity, which was a childcare center um, with an option to pay an in-lieu fee. Uh, the applicant ultimately elected to pay that in-lieu fee prior to uh, starting construction. Um, and, th and this project is under construction at this point. And so for context, Menlo portal here is shown in pink uh, with the two buildings of the apartment on the, the right side or, or east, and then the office building on the west portion of the site at the corner of Independence and Constitution. This is adjacent to the 111 Independence Drive. And as part of those two projects, the applicants have been working together on some shared access. So while it's not an official Paseo, there is some shared access uh, between this project site and the 111 Independence Drive site to provide a, a pedestrian bike connection between Independence and Constitution. That's shown in the kind of uh, purple dots uh, between the buildings. And Hotel Moxie, which is a non-bonus level project, this is located at Haven, where Haven does its bend uh, off of Marsh and Haven and Bayfront um, before um, going north along the, the uh, 101 freeway. And this is a 163 room hotel. It includes a uh, coffee shop on the ground floor open to the public. Uh, and on the uh, podium level, there's a bar and a restaurant uh, that would be also open to the public and a publicly accessible outdoor uh, rooftop garden um, space uh, that, that would be accessible from Haven directly to it without going through the lobby. Uh, this one is currently under review. Uh, so moving uh, east between um, uh, well, Chrysler and Independence and Jefferson area, we have one, two, three Independence, Menlo Uptown and Menlo Flats, and then an office project at uh, Commonwealth Building 3, 162, 164 Jefferson Drive. Uh, Menlo Uptown, this is a uh, project that has a mix of apartments and for sale townhomes. So you'll see the townhomes on the left of the image. Uh, a Paseo in the middle, that is an adopted Paseo from the city's uh, Connect Menlo General Plan update, um, an adopted zoning map, and so that's part of the project, and then the apartment building to the right. Uh, in total, there's 483 dwelling units. That includes uh, a mixture of studio to four bedroom units, the four and the three bedrooms being in the townhome units. There are 73 total below market rate units on site. And then this, this project's community amenity, this, this project has been approved by the Planning Commission uh, the community may includes the Ravenswood Family Health Network and Urgent Care Center on this project site. As I mentioned, there's a Paseo from the adopted zoning map that would connect Independence and Constitution Drives. And another context map here for Menlo Uptown shown in the pink buildings and then Paseo in the kind of purple pink connecting Jefferson and Constitution. Uh, nearby uh, Menlo Flats, this is a, uh, another project that shares a common property line with Menlo Uptown. This is a single building. It does include um, 158 dwelling units, uh, including studios and four bedrooms, uh, no one or two bedrooms or three bedrooms. It does have a mix of, of smaller studio apartments and larger four bedroom units. Uh, about 13,400 square feet of office and 1,600 square feet of commercial use. The commercial will be on the ground floor for a total of 15,000 square feet of commercial uses. There will be 21 uh, below market rate units, once again, at various levels of affordability. This project status, uh, we intend to release the final IR this Wednesday, um, and it will go to the Planning Commission for your review on um, the 28th of March. Uh, the community may that's proposed is the payment of the in-lieu fee, um, and this project includes a portion of a Paseo. And so if I go back to the last image, it is um, <clears throat> kind of on the right side of the building or the east facing side of the building, uh, it's a portion of the Paseo that's shared between four properties in the area. So this would be the first uh, stage of that Paseo. And just another map for context here for Menlo Flats. Uh, Commonwealth Building 3, this is an office project, uh, just uh, shy of 250,000 square feet. It's the third building on the Commonwealth Corporate Center. Uh, we commonly refer to it as Commonwealth Building 3. It's at 162 Jefferson Drive. Um, and let's see, 
the total campus uh, with this building and the existing two buildings would be a little over, it would be 510,000 roughly square feet of office space. It does include some publicly accessible open space through the Paseos that were adopted as part of the general plan update along the southern edge of the project. And it's currently under review by staff. We are, we're in the process of developing the draft EIR for this project. Uh, one, two, three independence. So going back to a residential project, uh, this is a mix of uh, apartments and townhomes. Um, there are 316 um, apartment buildings. Those are studios, uh, one bedroom and two bedroom units and 116 for sale townhomes. Uh, there are 48 apartment um, BMR units and 18 for sale townhomes um, that are BMR uh, currently proposed to be provided in, in a mix of income levels. This, this project does also include a Paseo from an adopted zoning map, and I'll get to a site plan in a second, uh, that, that con connects between um, independence and uh, constitution. And so uh, that Paseo does run through the, the middle of the project site, and this project is currently under review. And here's a picture of the apartment building. And then the site plan, the Paseo uh, is to the left of the apartment building, cutting from constitution to independence and does include a larger kind of publicly accessible uh, park open space in the, in the middle of the townhomes. And the townhomes are generally located along independence um, and Chrysler. And so moving to the projects east of Willow Road, um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll focus first on the life science projects um, along O'Brien. So 1005 O'Brien Drive, also 13, referred to as 1320 Willow Road. Um, that, that project uh, is, is one of the newest submittals that we have, along with the 1030 O'Brien Drive um, project on the south side of O'Brien. And so one thing to note here, I, I did mention earlier that every project was a, a, a bonus level project at the hotel. I, I was mistaken and now realizing that I was incorrect there. 1030 O'Brien Drive was recently submitted uh, and that's a base level project. Uh, the south side of O'Brien um, those, those are all base level zoning. There, there's no bonus level available on those life science uh, properties. And so with that, we'll move to talk through these four projects and including CS Bio and 1125 O'Brien Drive are two life science buildings adjacent to each other. So 1005 O'Brien Drive, here are some renderings um, for the commission's benefit. And just a brief overview of the project. It's about 230,000 square feet of R&D space uh, between two life science buildings. It does include a parking structure and is intended to be constructed in multiple phases or at least two phases um, uh, due to the existing uh, conditions of the site and existing um, uses. And as, we, as I mentioned a minute ago, it's one of the newer projects, so it's currently under review. And here's a site plan since it has multiple buildings, just to give context. It does include a amenities building, um, adjacent to the garage. Uh, CS Bio phase three. Uh, so here are some renderings. And this is an approximately 100,000 square foot new building located at the corner of uh, Kelly Court and O'Brien Drive. So I'll go back one slide. It, it's a taller building that you see here. Uh, the low rise building is existing 20 Kelly Court building that would remain. And then the new parking structures where uh, a portion of the existing low rise building um, would be demolished and then that's the existing single story uh, warehouse building. So as I just mentioned, a portion of 20 Kelly Court will remain. The 100,000 square foot uh, R&D office building would also include a 10,000 square foot ground floor restaurant space um, at, the, uh, at the corner of, of uh, Kelly Court and O'Brien Drive. As I mentioned, uh, the existing building at 20 Kelly Court uh, would remain a portion of it and the status, this project is under review. We're currently in the environmental review phase. And so for context here, this is, this is a multi, multiple building project site uh, showing the layout. The 1075 O'Brien Drive building on the map here is the, the new building with 20 Kelly Court to remain in the parking garage also proposed. Adjacent to the CS Bio project is 1125 O'Brien Drive. And this is a proposed 132,000 approximately square foot life science building. It does include a ground floor commercial space. Um, the development also includes the parcel of one Casey court uh, currently proposed to be used for surface level parking. And this project is also under review. We're, we're currently in the environmental review phase. 
So then north of the Hetch Hetchy right away are, are two projects adjacent to each other, the Willow Village project, which is a mixed use uh, master plan that's shown here in orange uh, for the context. And then 1350 Adams Court is a proposed life science building. And so here's an image of Willow Village's proposed Main Street. Um, <clears throat> the commission received a presentation for Willow Village back in January, so I won't go into too much detail here, but it is approximately up to um, 1,730 dwelling units, 1.6 million square feet of office and accessory space. And so that does include a, a maximum of 1.25 million square feet of office, and then up to 350,000 square feet of the accessory spaces, which which could be the media and collaboration space um, and other kind of support uses, um, conference center space, uh, things like that for use uh, by um, the project sponsor Meta. The project would include up to 200,000 square feet of retail, non-office commercial uh, that, that does currently uh, include a proposed grocery store, pharmacy, and other entertainment and restaurant uses. Uh, there will also be a 193 room hotel on the project site. A few more things to note for the project. Um, bike and pet access for this project uh, would include an elevated park across Willow Road uh, and a proposed tunnel below Willow Road that would connect uh, the project site with the Meta West Campus, which also links to the undercrossing under Bayfront Expressway to the East Campus and the Bay Trail. Um, there would also be a bike ped path or Paseo from the adopted zoning map uh, between the Adams Court project and the Willow Village project sites. Uh, that's currently proposed to be completely on the Willow Village project site, uh, but, but would meet the intent of that um, bike ped connection uh, north-south between O'Brien Drive and, um, and the Dumbarton Corridor. Uh, the project does include public accessible open space. And so just to highlight a few of them here, there would be a 3.5 acre public accessible park, a dog park, a town square, and then like I mentioned, the elevated park. And what's important to know is the offsite improvements. It does include the Hamilton Avenue parcels, which uh, there would be the proposed realignment of Hamilton Avenue uh, to create a, uh, a, a, a new intersection on Willow Road uh, with some better designed angles for line of sight and access. Uh, and that would allow for the potential expansion of retail uses on Hamilton Avenue parcel north and the reconstruction of the Chevron service station on, on the south parcel. And then here's a rendering of the um, publicly accessible park. The programming has not been determined at this time, but this is, this is one concept for it as a passive park. And then adjacent to this uh, project, the Will Village project, excuse me, is the 1350 Adams Court project. Uh, this is a 260,000 square foot proposed life science building. Um, it's located on the undeveloped northern portion of the 1350 or 1305 O'Brien Drive um, uh, parcel. So there's, a, there's an existing life science building that would remain on the project site. And then this new project would be built on the undeveloped current uh, northern portion. It's under review. We're currently in the environmental review stage and intend to or plan to release an EIR, draft EIR, excuse me, um, in the near future. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I have one uh, clarifying question. There are two hotels in that presentation, one, uh, the Moxie on Haven Road, and the other uh, in Willow Village. I understand that the zoning doesn't permit two hotels in this district. Is, is that correct? Only one of them could actually be built? Uh, both hotels could be built. The, the General plan update uh, studied up to 400 hotel rooms in the Bayfront area uh, with the proposed hotel on the Willow Village project site and Hotel Moxie uh, were just shy of the total hotel room cap at about 396 units or so. I have to look that up for you, but the hotels currently the number of rooms are within the development potential that we studied in the EIR and identified in the general plan update. Both hotels do need use permits. They're not in parcels that were designated as hotels being permitted by right, um, or they would still need architectural control. So I wanna be careful how I say that, but uh, without a use permit for that discretionary action. Both of these hotels do need that discretionary review. The Hotel Moxie is, is requesting a use permit. 
the proposed Willow Village project includes a conditional development permit, which which encompasses things like the that you would see in a use permit or an architectural control application. So the 400 uh, room limit doesn't count the 240 rooms for the Susan M Hotel. It counts the 40 rooms that were added as part of this conditional development permit amendment for Susan M. And then I apologize, I should have. Uh, explained that as well. So those 40 rooms are part of uh, the 400 room cap. The 200 rooms were that were permitted for the uh, original conditional development permit for the campus expansion project or the Meta West campus, uh, buildings 21, 22, and the hotel. Those were uh, the prior to the general plan update. Okay, so um, 40 rooms are included in the 400 room room count. So the currently proposed hotels, together with the 40 rooms that we just approved for SIS and M, um, actually, I'm not sure those were approved. That was continued. But the 40 rooms requested for SIS and M, we put the room count above the 400 room limit. Is that correct? You, you, you got me scared for a second, but I just did some math here. 100, we're at uh, 396. Counting the 40 rooms for- Counting the 40 SIS rooms. Okay. Yeah, I was about to second guess my math. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ricks. I apologize. I may have missed it. I didn't hear the description for 1030 O'Brien. Good. That, yes, because we, <laughs> we just got that and I haven't had a chance to summarize it. Um, if you'll give me a minute, I can pull up the information and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. Uh, Commissioner Riggs, if that or, or just roughly, I don't know whether it's a 50,000 square foot project or a 100,000 square foot, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah let, if you'll give me a minute, I can look it up real quick and, and, and I'll follow up after answering some more questions. Well, and, and a brief version is fine, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Commissioner DeCardi. Uh, Commissioner Tate had her hand raised. There's my curtain again, right? It um, is. <laughs> so I, I'm just wondering, I know in the earlier stages of um, you know, getting feedback from the community and um, what have you for Willow Village, um, there was a lot of talk about, you know, um, which I'm happy they're not doing now, a flyover and, and roads going all over the place for the buses and what have you. But um, I do think that it is, worth looking at putting a road in from the life sciences willow village area that goes directly out to bayfront and i'm not really sure um who to petition for that because it it definitely is something that should be reviewed at this stage and i know tarleton is opening up some streets from east palo alto to get over into his area um to make it a uh the life sciences area to make it a smooth um uh access for people to get out into that area. And again, it would be great. It would relieve so much pressure off of not only Willow Road, but also our neighbors and university if there was a road that just went straight. So Kyle, how do we go about trying to make sure that that is a conversation someplace? So this is a presentation, so I, I, I'm, I want to answer your question, but I got to be careful not to have a dialogue um, that is something that's not on the agenda. Uh, certainly, as part of the Willow Village project, as with all these projects, we'll be bringing those back to the Planning Commission for study sessions, for public hearings, for their environmental review. So Willow Village will have a draft EIR public hearing and a study session at the uh, Commission in the near future. Uh, those types of comments and questions uh, may or may not be appropriate for the environmental review, but may also may be appropriate for the study session component. Um, and I just want to stress for all the projects that there will be, um, with the ones that haven't been approved yet by the planning commission or council, you know, that there will be opportunities to review through a public hearing and or study session or both um, the entitlements, the environmental review, and the general design of the project. Fantastic. Thank you. Mr. Riccardi. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, question from Commissioner Tate, and I think it dovetails with the question that I have. 
Um, as we look at individual projects and as you look at individual projects, on one level, we had a plan, I think, that was supposed to be in place for development over decades. And that development is being condensed, which is an incredible amount of pressure on a community, but it's also a great opportunity, I think, to make sure that those that the development works in uh, concert on behalf of the whole community. And certainly part of the plan in place as the projects on the um, other side of Willow you described have Paseos and developers have to pay attention to those Paseos. And you just gave a good example, I think, of two developers working together informally to try to make something work. On the projects on this side of Willow that we're just talking about, the ones you just reviewed, I'm curious how you as staff and as how we as a planning commission are supposed to look at those intersections when we are only looking at one project. So Commissioner Tate's question is a great one. That may or may not be relevant to the Willow Village discussion. It may actually be tangential to every project and yet potentially across all of them be material. And it's my experience from looking at the recent ones around Willow Village and Life Sciences that each one of those presentations does a great job talking about the project and then has sort of arrows that go off into um, a mist about how it's gonna be connecting for the community. But it makes it very difficult as a planning commissioner to know how the site is being used most effectively, where the open space is, how to think about access without understanding that connectivity. And so I want to, my question to you is how do you as planning staff look at that connectivity? And how can we as a planning commission understand that connectivity so we can actually appropriately review these individual projects? So, so great, great comments and appreciate the, the sentiments. Uh, certainly, to answer your question, I think I can't answer here. The staff, we, we do look at the the projects uh, in the context of the neighboring proposed projects and how uh, they, they do interact, interplay there. We certainly look at our plan um, and, and look at the design requirements and how we can work within the confines of the plan to, to work with an applicant to try to improve or enhance some connectivity. So we certainly do that as part of our uh, plan review um, with any project and especially when we have a lot of projects together. So your, your comments well taken, we, we certainly do look at that. Um, in, in terms of the second part, uh, I wanna be careful to answer clarifying questions and, and not try to have too much of a dialogue, but certainly I think um, your points well taken. I, I think a lot of it could be provided in the staff report for the commission to better understand the connectivity. So I, I think that might be where you're going with that. And correct me if I don't want to um, be careful. I don't want to try to assume something, but I think uh, it sounds like a lot of it would be how information is provided to the commission in those reports to understand that context, which, which we, can, we can take that feedback here and, and work on. Yeah, I think that's a fair um, summary of my question. And um, ultimately, um, I appreciate you explaining how planning does it, it's not my experience that we see it in that way. And so I think that would, that, that would be helpful um, in that way. Um, I'll pause, I have a couple others in different kinds of, but I'll pause to see if other commissioners would like to. Through the chair, if, if I could uh, respond to Commissioner Riggs question for 1030, um, sure. O'Brien, real quickly. So, so it's, uh, I do have that information. It, the proposed project, uh, it would be in multiple buildings, would be approximately 86,000 square feet uh, of R&D space. Uh, that's at the maximum 55% uh, FAR for life sciences R&D in um, the life sciences zoning. There's a small commercial component, uh, a couple of thousand square feet, and those that is permitted to go above the 55% by 10% in non-office, non-life science kind of support commercial uses. Thank you, Mr. Brada. Mr. Harris. Thank you. I have some similar um, 
questions about how we look at this area in its entirety. Um, I like, I appreciate the presentation and I like how you have um, shown us in those sort of purple pink dashed lines where the different Perseos are. Um, it's hard for me when it's on each one of those pages to look at them on its whole. And I wonder, is there a way that we could see you know, all of it and I could take a look at, oh, I, I, we could all see how the paseos and the bike paths, all those work together and how we can, how if, if people are living or working over there, how those all connect and where maybe are the missing pieces um, so I'm wondering if those could all be put um, on one kind of map for us and um, and then maybe to uh, Commissioner DeCarty's point they, that that sort of overall map could be brought back to us as we look at individual projects so we can understand um, you know what we're looking at where the gaps are and how we can get from one place to another and then that opens up um you know per uh commissioner tate's thinking of how how we can get um how, how we can how we can move people around um that's my first well actually what could you maybe you could comment on that i have one more thing i think we, we can certainly look into that it, it's a point well taken I, I think we understand the the context uh and the benefit of having a map that shows that interrelationship between projects, we can certainly look into that. Um, this presentation was definitely meant to be uh, an opportunity to learn more about each project and, and see the development that's being proposed. Um, and we, certainly the, the scope of it wasn't to go into that level of detail for the interconnectivity between the projects, but we can certainly uh, look at um, you know, a, a map mm -hmm. or, or some, some sort of a, available um, you know, uh, imagery on our website for that, so that we can share with the commission as well. Yeah, I, I think I must have had a misunderstanding. I, I thought this was going to be kind of an overall view of where we are um, in this, um, you know, as we move forward in, in this area. Um, so that would be terrific if we could add that um, for our, so for our edification and, and understanding. Um, my other question is, as, as I look at this, I think this was supposed to be about a 20 year development. And um, I know that this is all happening much faster than, than it was anticipated when this was put together. And so that makes me think about what, um, if we think about the EIR that was put together for this, the program EIR, <clears throat> I wonder how some of those um, determinations that were in the EIR might be different had we put together that EIR assuming a much shorter time frame, like six to 10 years. Um, I guess we don't really go back to EIRs, but I'm just wondering what aspects um, might have changed and what mit mitigations would we have been looking for in this case? And is there, do we ever go back and can we go back to think through about what, what other mitigations we might wanna make given how quickly this development is happening in that area, especially as it is completely surrounding the Bellhaven neighborhood. Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, let me try to answer it uh, for informational purposes here without um, veering off of the agenda item. These are all very good questions. I appreciate them from, from the commissioners, but we gotta be mindful of, of the agendized item as a presentation. But, it, and so I say that just to, to set the expectation that this could be a brief um, discussion here and we, we may need to schedule a different discussion later on, on, on that topic. Uh, what I will say is that all of the projects that are at the bonus level are, um, we are preparing, staff are preparing uh, an environmental impact report for each project. That, pro that EIR will look at each project's potential impacts it also does look at the cumulative impacts with the project, um, and it does identify, even if the, um, the timeline changes, it does look at cumulative development potential of the, of the current project, the projects um, in the Bayfront area, 
within Connect Menlo and, and does take that into account in terms of the overall growth and the cumulative growth, if that helps. So there's project specific analyses that, that will build off of Connect Menlo um, and may or may not identify the same or additional mitigation measures as needed based on the development. So, so if that, that kind of helps understand mm. the, 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 that each project that's not at a base level is required to do an EIR and, and we will be looking at project specific mitigations, uh, which may or may not be the same as, as Connect Menlo. Right, but that's not taking into account the speed at which the overall uh, plan is happening, correct? It, it does look at that in, to, for certain uh, topic areas in terms of whether or not the build out horizon year potentially changing or some components of it changing affect the analysis. It, it, does, it does look at that to a certain extent. Okay, I'll, I'll let somebody else um, ask questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we had a hand raised, but we no longer do. Is that Commissioner Kennedy? Did you have your hand raised? It was mine, and it, it it's more around sort of some of the conversation that has already happened. So I didn't want to just listen to hear myself talk. Um, but you know, back back in the day, so it must be six or seven seven years ago now. Um, you know, Meta prepared a an enormous massing model of all of the projects they hope to do. And I think it also included a rendition of Willow Village. And I'm wondering, and the, you know, the accountability that they have always presented is, is, I think has always been very useful and very helpful. And I'm wondering if when you weave together all of these sites, because I'm one dimensional, I'm not a one dimensional person. Maps are, you know, I, I appreciate maps, but I like to see things in 3D. 3D. Um, and I'm wondering if we took all of these various projects together, it would make it would make it easier for folks to understand what goes where and how it all operates, and more importantly, what connections are missing. And so I'm wondering, and it's not to be answered here, but I'm wondering how how do we, as a community, and as a commission, look at everything in real space, right? I th something like that could be built. Um, I don't know on whose dime, um, but I think it would be really useful specifically around um, what Commissioner Tate has requested sort of, you know, uh, a, a new connection to, to Bayfront Expressway um, to alleviate some of the traffic through the neighborhoods. Um, and perhaps where else there might be, you know, in, in in theory, on maps, things look a certain way. In reality, in massing models, they operate very differently. And so that's just my, my question. Uh, we will certainly look into how we can better uh, relay the totality of the proposed project in the Bayfront area. Um, really, really appreciate the, the comment and perhaps we can do something with the um, images from the applicants models and put it into it. We, we are limited with resources, but, but we will certainly see what we can do. I, I think I understand the desire from the commission or from individual commissioners. I have a feeling it, it, it um, we, we've been hearing it about uh, putting something together that does show the, the Bayfront area that, that maybe is more than just a map of each project in its own little silo. I think, I think we get the, the, the sentiment. Thank you. Commissioner Riccardi. Yeah, two things. The first one I wanna pick up on the thread of the conversation about the distinction between the program EIR for this region and individual project EIRs just to see if I understood your, your answer. Um, so I, I, I believe we have a program EIR. And then on the individual EIRs, um, they do look at what has happened in some ways in the intervening time. 
So we get that, there, I mean, that there's unique things to that project to take a look at that are essentially not covered by the program EIR. But I guess I'm just still a little bit confused. You said there was something else in there that, in it, that a project EIR actually also looks at something about the cumulative development that has happened since the program EIR. And if you could explain that just a little bit more. Yeah, so, so, so the, the project level EIR will analyze the project's impacts on, on the environment. Um, and it will, it will also look at a cumulative analysis, which is complete build out of, of the city in a, in a future year. Uh, and what, it, what we have done is where, um, and, I, and I'm, I, I can't off the top of my head explain exactly where and when, but if uh, development has uh, occurred at a different pace, we have referenced whether that has affected that analysis or not um, in the EIRs. And so we, we certainly can try to explain that, but, but for a lot of them, the project level analysis is the analysis and it's not, it's not cumulative in the same way. And I think the, the historic cumulative analysis is traffic um, when it comes to like building upon each project, although traffic is not in level of service type of traffic is not a CEQA impact anymore. So we gotta be careful about how we talk about that. Um, it's, it's now vehicle miles traveled as a metric. Um, and that is, that is not an additive, that's a, a efficiency metric per employee, per resident, it doesn't change with the cumulative projects. Um, it could potentially go down in the cumulative when you have more complementary land uses, but in the, you look at it, uh, you look at it as the projects, the MT. I'm getting off topic, sorry. Um, the, the point is that we look at the project, we look at the cumulative, and we do identify if there's anything that's changed in between the project and the cumulative from Connect Menlo that would affect that cumulative analysis. So are there new projects in the area that haven't been um, incorporated into the program level EIR that would affect that analysis? Um, and we also have looked at whether or not the pace would have affected any of the outcomes of the um, impacts, if that makes sense. It does. I guess that'd be my follow-up question goes the other direction, which is, but you had a program EIR that was put in place before any of this happened that has a whole level of assumptions you now have a reality of what has happened since then. When do you go back and relook at that program EIR? And your VMT example is beautiful because you actually have a reality now that is different than whatever the projections were based on VMT in 2015, which is on models that were from 2010. When do you go back and look at the program EIR around those things? So let, let let me try to answer, um, and I want to be mindful of the questions about projects versus the questions about you know uh, methodology and CEQA, which is which is obviously not on the agenda here. But we we um, we what you do is you look at the project analysis in each EIR and you refer back to Connect Menlo, but things could have changed and you would, the project analysis would be the, the analysis on the ground today. And it would look at some updated conditions where appropriate. So model years in terms of like baseline tra traffic, I know traffic is not the, a CEQA thing, but it's easy to talk about. We have updated our trips, right? Trip trip counts from Connect Menlo aren't being used in the project level EIRs for the non sequel level now. So things like, that's an easy one to try to explain here. Um, it, it just, it's obviously not a CEQA thing anymore, but it, it's probably a better um, metric because it's easy to think about traffic and level of service. And um, so we have updated models for, for background conditions like existing traffic conditions in the area that we use in the project level analysis. So, so there are updates that happen between the program level and the project level, but certainly for areas that are still applicable from Connect Menlo, those carry forward um, and you tear off of those analyses and, and then you update as needed for the project level analysis with any project level metrics or conditions as appropriate. I appreciate the answer. Um, it feels kind of relevant. We're talking about all these projects, each of these projects has an EIR, but but fair enough. I, I just um, want to be careful of, of the agendized topic and, and not run afoul of, of uh, talking about 
and having a discussion versus a question and answer type of thing. So that, that's right. where I want to be careful. Well, that's fine. I'm, I was, they were, from my mind, clarifying questions. I appreciate it. Thank you for the time on this. My other question is, if you could clarify um, or remind at least me, how do we look at um, Hetch Hetchy and that Hetch Hetchy right of way? Um, and I say that because in recent discussions we've had about projects, there's been references about where the public use space is gonna be in a project, where the cut throughs are gonna be in the project with some um, nodding to Hetch Hetchy and the opportunity set for utilizing that for being able to get through or get access. And yet there's a current use of Hetch Hetchy, certainly Mid Peninsula High School, which is a closed campus, has a parking lot that is over Hetch Hetchy. Um, so I say that as an example, not to answer that question, but just to understand how are we supposed to, as planning commissioners, make sense of what we're told about the potential utilization of Hetch Hetchy, because um, we haven't had that discussion in this context. So how should we think about that? So I think um, to start from a staff level, we're, we're, we certainly are exploring um, all opportunities to utilize that right away. Um, obviously with the, uh, you know, approval of the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. Uh, so we, we, are, we are looking at how that area could be utilized for, you know, additional bike ped connections. We are, we're, we are talking to applicants about it. Um, ultimately, it does rest on whether or not uh, the SFPUC would approve any access or encroachments, but it's certainly something that that staff has been looking at as an opportunity and, and how potentially that um, right away that, that does have a use below ground in, in terms of the, the, the high pressure um, hatch actually right away pipelines, uh, but does have this potential for maybe some at grade access that we'd like to look into. So we, we certainly look into that. Um, we do flag it you know, on a lot of study sessions that the commission has seen as, as questions for discussion on whether or not um, that should be continued to be explored by applicants and staff. I appreciate that. I, there are other hands. I'll just say that I think it would be helpful sometimes in our discussions to actually have planning commission staff be able to say whether something we are being told by an applicant is actually completely doable or conjecture or what the steps would be, especially in that kind of context. Because I think we end up in back and forth having a discussion where you all have expertise that in those moments would be good to bring to bear. Um, so I appreciate the answer. And I guess to that point that you're all looking at it, I don't know that necessarily we get that insight in real time in that way. So, but th thank you for the answer. Mr. Kennedy. So uh, something else about the the, the Hetch Hetchy right away. It's interesting to me because, um, you know, that spine is really complex. And in a lot of cases, I've seen it developed in a very low, low pressure kind of way with and because you can't put anything permanent and you can't do, put anything underground. Uh, for example, there are a couple of uh, playgrounds that have been built on those sites. Um, the, the issue, too, becomes that it's it's not 24 hour access, right? So it's dawn to dusk access or, or, or something. So um, it would be interesting to see how those, how the Hetch Hetchy right of way could be uh, deployed in an impermanent way to create some type of uh, ribbon throughout the various sites. And, but, but it, you know, Kyle, you mentioned it, that it really depends on what the SFPUC deems appropriate. That's all. Mr. Barnes. Good evening. Thank you, Commissioner Doran. And thank you, uh, Mr. Parada, for your presentation this evening. I mean, it's, um, it's just so informative to get the breadth of the projects and get a look at them. Um, and what's going on. Well, we have the opportunity to get that 
deck that you presented tonight. I didn't see it in tonight's agenda as a PDF. Is that something we could potentially access? Yeah, I, I finished it at seven fifteen. So I'll, I'll we'll, we'll we'll add it to the minutes and <laughs> and and send it over. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that the commission and the public has access to it, which. It brings me to a point of order, Chair Dorn, it's your prerogative, but this item could certainly have public comment if you wanted to call for it. It, it, it is up to the chair. I just want to make sure that, that I stress that I didn't uh, do that with my presentation in the beginning. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, Commissioner Barnes, did you have any other questions? Maybe we'll finish up with you and then uh, open public comment. Why don't we do this? Why don't I yield the floor to public comment? I do have a couple um, comments. And so if you want to do public comment, you can come back to me. Um, and then I'm happy to finish up. Okay. Uh, I will open the meeting up to public comment. Uh, Mr. Turner, can you look and see if we have any hands raised from the public? Let's speak about this. Um, we do have a hand raised. Um, let me get Zoom ready here. Um, we do have Pam Jones. Um, as a reminder, you will have three minutes to share your comment or question. Please clearly state your name and address, political jurisdiction in which you live, or your organizational affiliation. Um, if you have multiple speakers on the same account, please let us know at the beginning of your comment, and we will make sure each speaker has an opportunity to speak for three minutes. Um, and Ms. Jones, you should be able to mute yourself. Good evening, commissioners. And I cannot tell you how grateful I am that we're finally having this information and this discussion. My name is Pamela Jones. I'm a longtime resident of District 1, and I'm not affiliated with anybody other than myself. Um, this, this discussion is critical to how we're gonna move forward. All of the information that you're asking for this evening, particularly with um, traffic, was asked even before the uh, general plan was passed. Um, all of the development and the zoning was decided so that the um, developers would be able to do exactly what they're doing today. So none, none of this part is a mystery. Um, and, and it was said there needed to be one EIR that included every single project, including traffic. And we also talked about environmental justice, but remember this was in 2016. And so environmental justice didn't uh, come to the forefront as SB 1000 until the following year, you know, very surprising there. Um, I, I too, I desperately wanna see one, um, uh, one place where there's a three dimensional uh, uh, picture of what the entire district one is gonna look like if, with everything that we have. I'm certain there are models that, um, that can be bought that you put, uh, put the information in and the model is created intentionally. Uh, we have uh, schools in the area that do planning. Uh, I think San Francisco State has, or San Jose State has a, uh, a planning depart, uh, degree program and we could go to them and, um, and ask them to do it because I do understand that the staff is, uh, has more than enough uh, with what they're doing. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is that there are pieces of this discussion tonight that I had put in writing in a number of the EIRs um, so that there would be documentation that these concerns were brought up um, uh, even before the shovels were in the ground. And the last thing that I want to say is that each one of you needs to drive through that Bayfront area and look at the Graystar projects that are now being done. And then imagine what it's going to be like when the rest of the projects are completed and that every unit has a person in it and they're gonna be trying to get somewhere and they can only do it by car, bicycle, or um, uh, if it's close enough, but otherwise by car, because there's no transportation. So we really need to look at the whole picture and I'm just really grateful that you as a commission is more than willing to have this information. So thank you again. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Turner, do we have any other hands raised? I don't see any hands raised at this time. Um, just as a reminder, if you do wish to give public comment, click the um, raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, or if you're calling in and want to give public comment, um, click star nine on your phone. No other hands? Uh, none at this time. Okay, I'm gonna close public comment and bring it back to the commission. Uh, Commissioner Barnes was speaking when we broke for public comment. Did you have further remarks, Commissioner Barnes? I do, thank you for, thank you for asking and, and coming back. Uh, so I've got two amplifications and one confirmation uh, amp, amp Amplification number one is to Commissioner Ducardi's statement about the staff and the resource we have in staff and, and how uh, we benefit when they have, um, when they give, when, when in the context where they can uh, weigh in on applicants as X, staff uh, sees Y, and staff has an opinion on the feasibility. Uh, of, of why, and, and we all benefit from that. And I think we kind of went through that exercise with the sign um, ordinance uh, exercise that we went through and, and you know, planning commission looking to staff to provide some of their expertise on this. And, and certainly there's opportunities as we walk through um, continued approvals uh, in this area. Uh, the other ampl amplification is, I did hear you say, Mr. Parada, that updated models are used. Uh, in the project uh, level analysis, and um, that's good to hear, and I'm, and I'm glad to hear that. Uh, the third one I have is a confirmation, and uh, I, I've heard a number of times uh, the, the suggestion that there's been a acceleration of development in the, uh, through the, the the general plan, the um, Connect Menlo, and certainly in my experience, uh, when this when Connect Menlo was put together, there was not an anticipation of a staging of development. There was a, a horizon which was established to look at a build-out time frame, and then within that time frame, there certainly was not a a staging uh, per se or a um, there was not a suggestion that there would be a cadence for development. And I think everyone, and the way that it's set up, Connect Menlo is that. It's a first come, first serve uh, in many respects. It's first come, first serve when it comes to residential units. It's first come, first serve when it comes to hotel units, um, go, uh, gross square footage when it comes to commercial. So uh, I don't think that the issue is that there's a clustering now because that was always anticipated and it's not related to the 2040 number. 2040 number is just the horizon. Now, how that gets worked in is something we have to deal with. But it, the process hasn't been turned on its head. The process was, was set up um, in such a way that you had a horizon and you had developments coming in. Now, our job is to figure out, you know, to the extent that these are coming in concurrently, um, you know, how does that look and how is it going to work together? But my point is that this is not, the process is not as, is not an intended process, but it's a process that nonetheless we need to pay attention to. Um, as these cluster and these developments come forward. Um, so those are my three points. And thank you again for uh, spending time with us this evening and um, uh, enhancing our dialogue as it relates to a comprehensive view of this area and how to make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Do we have other commissioners that would wish to speak now? I'm not seeing any. Okay, I think I'll close the presentation item. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Prada. That was really helpful. And I'm sure involved not insignificant amount of time on your part. I uh, just want to second the request to get the report. I'd like to see that myself. Um, 
So I'll move to informational items. Uh, Ms. Sandmeyer, do you have informational items for us? Uh, yes, so our next meeting um, is in two weeks, March 28th, and we have a number of items. We have a two unit development uh, on Bay Road. We have the Menlo Flats project um, for the final environmental impact report and the entitlements. And we also have a study session on the Parkline project, um, which is a proposal to redevelop the SRI campus. Um, that concludes my updates, but I'm happy to answer any questions. We have questions from Ms. Sandmeyer, Mr. Barnes. I have no question. I do have a thank you. Um, thank you for when doing the agenda for breaking those into PDF packets. Um, I personally found that super helpful. I know that we'd asked for that a couple of times and I wasn't expecting it, but it was done and I appreciate that. So thank you very much. I'm glad that was helpful. Mr. DeCarty. Yeah, I have a quick question, but before that, I'll just say I want to thank uh, uh, staff and, and Mr. Parada for the uh, effort and energy to have this session tonight. I know that's above and beyond the work you all have, but extraordinarily helpful in the background material. So thank you. My question is any update on uh, when we would, would move to a different way of meeting, if there's any further information given changes that are happening with public health guidance around the pandemic, or if that is still to be determined. I think it's still to be determined. Um, I will definitely keep the commission up to date um, if there's any changes. Okay, um, I think that's all from the commission. So thank you very much, Ms. Sandmeyer. And I will adjourn tonight's meeting. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks Chair Dorn. Be well everybody. <laughs>